we are back video number 14 uh so we started touching up on metformin idea was to talk about gross hormone testosterone as well but uh we ran out of time <laughs> and uh, today we're going to touch up on ideally gross hormone testosterone so maybe a little bit about the history of it benefits uh dangers who even need to consider that why is it even being talked about at the moment uh and all those kind of things so uh what what have you seen in uh, recent time uh in sense of gross hormone use it's what i have come across with a lot of guys i work with when they go to trt clinic or something like that when they get to age where something does not work right they are usually get prescribed GH as well. Is that something useful? Is this something completely waste of their money? Uh, and how did GH even kind of came around? So gross hormone. Right. So, I mean, so let's, let's just touch on just the basics of both of those, like history wise. Um, testosterone is obviously very, very old. Like, you know, it was invented a long time ago, 1920s and 30s was the first time it got kind of registered and that sort of stuff. And I think for the most part, most listeners kind of know what it is, but essentially it is it is a sex hormone in both men and women. And in men, it drives, uh, it's, it's more predominant and it drives a lot of uh, behavioral type things, uh, and, and that sort of stuff. It, it does in both, right? But in men, it's a little bit more um, subtle, right? Like if you go from 600 nanograms per deciliter of, of testosterone to 1,000, are you going to feel better? Yeah, probably. You're probably going to notice that. But is it going to completely change who you are or any of that? Like roid rage, that's not going to happen. Um, but at the same time, estrogen, the dual side of that, uh, in men will drive your sex drive, not testosterone. In women, it's the other way around. Your testosterone will drive your sex drive and volition and things of that nature. Um, you know, and, and it comes down to, it, it, it kind of gives you that, that confidence of when you were younger, like testosterone in general. Like if I had to describe it as a thing, it's confidence in a bottle. It's just that simple, right? <laughs> so is this why some countries, uh, I've heard in Russia, Greece, uh, they usually prescribe testosterone as antidepressant? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Yes. It is literal. Conf that's the best way to look at it. Confidence in a bottle. True TRT, right? True, true TRT. You're just replacing your growth hormone, taking it to the upper 90th percentile of, of a natural. You're going to be more confident. You're going to be, and then even slightly above that, right? I don't feel like there's a problem to go right to the limit and maybe step over the line a little bit. Um, as far as like the blood values, right? That you see, um, and then growth hormone. and would you ever even look into considering to get that we talked about everything like blood tests obviously number one so right. hey you check that your testosterone is normal limit yeah. is there anything wrong with that at all um so yeah so if you have history okay say you had some blood work when you were early 20s and then you get some blood work when you're in your 30 you know 35 or so that had some testosterone values and you're feeling a little off that your values in your 30s are subpar, first thing I would say is you now can consider growth hormone and the implications of, or not growth hormone, sorry, testosterone, and the implications of like taking that, like let's have that discussion. Because if, you, let's say in your 20s, you were walking around at like 800 nanograms per deciliter, um, which is close to the top of the range. Uh, and then in your 30s, it's 500. So that is almost a 50% drop, right? And it's normal. A doctor's not going to say, oh, you're clearly low testosterone. Here's a prescription. You might be feeling off. Yeah, at that difference, you might be like subpar as far as like mental, cognitive performance, emotional performance, all of that type of stuff. So at that point, I would have that discussion, you know, maybe we can talk to a doctor and tell them about all these things. Like you said, if you live, happen to live in a country where they actually can prescribe it for emotional type support, well, then they could care less. Maybe, maybe not, right? I don't live there. But in my eyes, I could care less what the number is. If you're telling me that you have emotional issues and your growth hormone number and you can and you have blood work that supports the idea that it was once much higher, mm -hmm. then yes. Now, 
some of a lot of people don't have that right so then it comes down to um, kind of getting a feel for what they're telling you one of the biggest things that i look at is sex drive sex sexual want and need or activity compared over the years right now there's a lot of factors that can lead into that like maybe you're just not with the right person right you kind of have to you have to become a, a friend with that person right like yeah, as far as like be honest uh, yeah you got to be honest right but as far as like okay i clearly am underperforming physically i just can't get hard sometimes i don't have a want to have sex even though i clearly love my wife and etc then and we look at your blood work and your testosterone is on the lower end but not low enough to get a prescription and your estrogen in men in your estrogen in men is like not it's significantly lower like it's still okay but significantly lower in the range compared to the testosterone value that right away starts to tell me okay maybe you're a lower aromatizer so you actually needed more testosterone to be able to be able to aromatize enough estrogen to have good sex drive and all of that and that starts to tell me a little bit about okay where is um your main like what's your baseline values that we've talked about before hey how much sunlight are you getting and all this stuff because testosterone and all growth all growth anabolism factors are regulated by light right so going so like, when someone says can't i just take supplement and just go on a treadmill what we talked yeah. about in previous videos about hey you need to get out and walk it's just not going to be the same is it no it's not uh, and that's where you know if 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 they're that again because you're probably going to have a hard time getting a doctor to give you something if your testosterone value is four or five hundred they're just not going to do that right mm -hmm. I'm not saying they won't. I'm just saying it's going to be an uphill battle. Like it's not going to be as easy as I walk in and I walk out with a testosterone prescription. So then it becomes, okay, let's do these things and maybe we get your testosterone in the right place. Uh, and even if we don't, what it'll do is it'll set you up to have less problems if you do get a testosterone prescription, okay? Again, there are problems with all of these. They're not all, hey, I take this, I'm fixed, and I'm ready to rock and roll for the next 15 years. There are drawbacks to these things, and these drawbacks have to do with long-term maladaptions, right? So there's a reason why your testosterone is low, okay? And I'm going to explain a little bit about that. And it has to, it dovetails exactly into growth hormone, and that's this. Um, your growth and stagnation cycles are regulated mainly not by food not by training but light okay especially the further from the equator you live because your body understands hey when the light cycle of the day is getting shorter so today is the last day of the shortest day of the year or tomorrow will be the shortest day of the year from that point forward okay so tomorrow's the winter solstice from that day forward the days are getting longer your body, if you have a good circadian rhythm, understands that. If as you're coming into winter, days are getting shorter, your testosterone levels will shoot up. Growth hormone will stay stagnant. The reason for that is over evolutionary performance, your testosterone levels are there to fuel, it's a sex hormone, fuel reproduction, right? Um, Coincidentally, you might have to fight people for that. So it makes you, you know, it, 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 it makes you uh, want to do those, not necessarily fight, but like be an alpha male, uh, et cetera, attract the opposite sex. And it just makes sense that as light cycles get shorter, your body's going to secrete more of those because it wants to prepare you to, um, uh, how would you say, uh, it, it's skipping my mind, but uh, the season of reproduction, right? The season of, of, <laughs> Hey, let's conceive when the light cycles are short, because what's the opposite side of that nine months later, light cycles are long. That means when you have your child, it's going to be in an environment that's more structured for survivability, right? But is this same for female as well? Yes, it is. So, but in the way of not necessarily like their testosterone value will go up as well if their circadian rhythm is intact because they now are going to seek out more of this type of activity yeah, because this is um, what people miss out is that testosterone for women 
will make them very needy for yeah. the man. Yeah, and, and oh, yeah, or or just sexually active in general, right? Whether they like men or not, you know, maybe they like women, but that's but at, at the end of the day, right? It's going to drive that want and need for sexual interaction, intimacy, all that type of stuff. Um, uh, from from a sex hormone standpoint, there are other hormones that are involved in this, but from a purely sex hormone standpoint. So what I'm saying is, is if you have a bad circadian rhythm then just taking testosterone exposes you to some risks because the lack of sunlight or lack of good circadian rhythm means that now your body, because testosterone is not by itself, like it just doesn't, hey, I have testosterone and it does this and then it doesn't do anything else. It interacts, it turns into estrogen, it interacts backhandedly with other sex hormones, including uh, dovetailing with uh, other growth factors like IGF-1 and growth hormone, those are all regulated to be controlled, right? Because anabolism is uh, the growth of anything, right? People have to understand that like an anabolic steroid or anabolism is not just growing muscle tissue, it's growing everything, right? So the, what it grows is regulated by the information that your body receives from the sun. And the stoppage of growth also happens by the sun. A lot of people don't know this, but UVB light stops anabolic growth, okay? It puts a halt on that um, uh, because nitric oxide is made. Like nitric oxide is fantastic uh, because it makes blood vessels um, uh, expand, lowers blood pressure. It's very healthy for you. One of the health things that people don't talk about is it actually slows down your redox. It slows down your electrical potential across the mitochondrial membrane. That's on purpose because if you had in limited uh, electrical potential, then you actually put yourself at risk for growing cells that you don't want to grow, right? And so like, like cancer and other things of that nature. So just taking testosterone and not exposing yourself to sunlight exposes you to some risks that you might not know about where now it's being converted to too much estrogen or it's being converted to too much other things or interacting in a negative way. Um, you know, a lot of people, if they, remotely have researched testosterone, the first thing they get told is, oh, you got to take uh, aromatase inhibitors uh, to stop, you know, estradiol. I'm like, yeah, just no, no, no. exactly something I wanted to ask about, but it's good yeah. you're touching up on it. Yeah, I'm like, no, 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 no. If, if you are exposing your body to uh, sunlight and you're not abusing testosterone, then you are going to self-regulate for yourself mm. internally how much testosterone needs to be converted, how much, like, these are like your body was making testosterone in your early 20s at large amounts. Why did you not get those things? It, it what if you didn't get those things, it was because you had an intact circadian rhythm then, which dictated the downstream effects, right? And that's where a lot of people, you know, they get put on TRT. The doctor never tells them about any of this shit. And so they're on TRT, their testosterone level is about where I would like it, but they have other issues going on and you're trying to manage them and all that type of stuff. And it comes down to, a lot of it comes down to, they're just an inside person. I, I need to try to get them outside as much as possible. Are there things that you need to do in that transition period? Yes, sometimes. The easiest one is we lower the testosterone dose, right? It, your, your body clearly cannot handle that much testosterone in its current state. And that's why I'm trying to Tell you yeah testosterone becomes fantastic if you can get it at the upper range or slightly above it becomes like the fountain of youth to regress you know 10 years off your age or whatever but only if you can handle that much testosterone with all its downstream effects that's what i'm trying to get you to understand or the, the audience is the thing that regulates those downstream effects is environmental not drugs right drugs put a band-aid on the shit that's going wrong. Your job or your doctor's job, I should say, is to really dial that in for you at your current state. Now I can come in and be like, okay, well we can change that. We can get you taking a higher dose of testosterone or you know, up to the level that we would like um, if we change your lifestyle first so that the downstream effects can start working correctly. Another downstream effect of this is too much red blood cells, right? Um, and you 
for the most part, are going to run into that at any dose of testosterone, but at the higher levels, it's more likely. Now, why do you need weight? Like, why do you produce way more red blood cells, especially if you don't do your cardio and you, you don't get outside? It's because um, you're not doing anything with those red blood cells, so they accumulate, right? If you do your cardio, and that's almost certainly enough sometimes, but if you're doing it inside, that cardio now loses value. Uh, not not to the point where it's zero, but to the point where now you ha might have to do more. The reason for that is because uh, blood interacts with sunlight, and sunlight tells that blood certain things like, hey, you have a lot of hemoglobin, and this person has a great redox potential if they get out in the sun a lot. So now that red blood is carrying way more oxygen. It's able to diffuse more oxygen because now nitric oxide is making blood vessels bigger. You're transporting things better. So a little bit extra red blood cells are beneficial in high lighting environments, right? But if you have low lighting environments, a little extra blood can mean the difference between, hey, I have a blood clot or now, right? That's, that's basically one of the risks of too much testosterone if you're not managing cardiovascular uh, work correctly and you're not managing daylight exposure correctly that is legitimately one of the risks right and, it, and it's when, a very common thing now that people just think i can supplement something with this thing or another and just take care of that when in reality it's really as basic as we started 13 videos ago go out for a walk drink your water make sure you're eating real food uh yeah. I just uh, today had a conversation with one of my guys and uh, his doctor just went through his blood values and said, oh, this is something off. You need to adjust your supplements. And he's not taking any. Right. Like, and, and you can't blame doctor for that because they're not taught those kind of things because what we do, we are focusing literally on lifestyle changes on my and your goal is to get the best out of someone by harming them as little as possible. That's how I can summarize it all pretty much. Yeah. yeah Whereas I mean, doctor will just give you drugs. <laughs> that's their job. Yeah. That's, that's yeah. what they've taught to do. <laughs> you know, they, they're not going to go into, hey, do this, do this, and go out for a walk and do sun exposure and whatnot, because not a single textbook will teach you that. Yeah. You and, need and to go be... on a tangent yourself and discover these things. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and then taking that even further, even if the doctor was smarter, and I'm not saying they're dumb. I'm just saying, even if they put in the time to actually find this information out, the doctor doesn't make any money by telling you to do this. Yeah. <laughs> like, oh, don't come ever see me again. Just go off. Exa <laughs> right. Exactly. Right. Well, like as horrible doctor, as it sounds, it's, uh, they obviously mean the best for you, but their yeah, tool, their, their hammer is drugs, right? That's yeah. what you came there. That's why you're paying them. That's what the pharmacy is getting paid. That's how the, the pharmaceutical rep that came to visit them the, at the beginning of the week sold them the pamphlets of all the fantastic drugs that they've invented. I'm not, and and I'm it definitely not. comes from the background of education because that's what you're taught. And you think yes. you are doing the best. Yeah. And if you're yes. not individual who goes and seeks out what else is out there, you, you'll never come to these research studies and all these kind of things about infrared lights, sun exposure, you know, cold exposure, all these kind of things that can drastically change your life and mm -hmm. cost you literally nothing. Yeah, for the most part. Yeah. I mean, if you really think about it, okay, some of the, a lot of the things that we talk about that are basics that need to be put in play or we have to try to get people to put them in play are free literally free okay yeah like as as free as it gets right um the thing that it costs you is a little bit of discomfort but that's everything right <laughs> yeah just because you need to change your lifestyle can you yeah. touch up a little bit on estrogen because obviously yes. a lot of people go hey i'm gonna take testosterone but that's what bodybuilders take to get jacked and this and that and you're like yeah it probably not one of the best tools to get you looking, uh, changing your physique drastically anyway. Uh, and at the same time, people go like, I need to take the estrogen blockers and it's estrogen is bad for you. But when we know for male, it actually gives you ridiculous sex drive. Yes. So, uh, yeah, so, so there's a, that a little bit. Yeah, is there like even a merit to ever supplement with estrogen? Mm, um, supplementing with estrogen is definitely different. In fact, 
oral estrogen is one thing that I try to get all females off of, you know, because this is where we run into, hey, uh, birth control, right? Uh, progesterone, synthetic progesterone, synthetic estrogens. Uh, I'm not saying that there isn't situations where you would want oral estrogen, but they are so small. I'd rather focus on, hey, if you take oral estrogen, it's probably doing more harm than good especially oral versions because they have research stating that um, it increases your cardiovascular risk mm. oral estrogens let's take it back a little bit yeah which, which goes back to your point of anti taking an anti-estrogen when you take your testosterone okay that has the same effect as taking oral estrogen it also has a negative downturn on cardiovascular stuff so What's a person to do? You take your testosterone and you let your body convert it to estrogen at the natural rate that's appropriate for your lifestyle at that moment. We can get that to come up by changing your lifestyle. Now, endogenous estrogen, in other words, estrogen that's been turned into, or sorry, uh, estrogen that's come from, if you're a male, it's come from your uh, aromatized enzyme, uh, which aromatized testosterone to turn it into estrogen, that's cardioprotective. And in women, uh, that estrogen comes from downstream DHEA um, and pregnenolone first, you know, then DHEA and then being turned through the, the ovaries and um, also adrenal glands into estrogen E1, E2, E3. Yeah, and that's something that's very important to understand that estrogen that's in your body it's actually it's not bad for you. It's very good for you. If anything, yes. it's beneficial. But when you start supplementing with estrogen blockers or estrogen itself, that's you're right. when you actually can start running into issues. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. So uh, then, then it comes, okay, so how do we manage estrogen? Well, if it's too much, then the first thing I like to look at is, okay, let's just look at your testosterone dose if you're taking testosterone because we can manage that literally this week, right? We can just bring it down next or take, you know, less of it immediately or none of it for a week or two. We can bring that down as far as the input. It'll take a little bit, a little while for the estrogen itself to come down. It and becomes a game of math, basically. Yeah, absolutely. Exactly. It can, it, exactly. It comes down to some calculations and we figure that out. No big deal, right? Or if we, if it was really out of hand, you know, then at that point for a very short period of time, we would take a little bit of estrogen blockers. I'm, I'm totally cool with that. But the simple solution is, okay, now we have this data. We drive, like, I never, ever, like, if somebody comes to me and they're like, hey, I just started on my testosterone. I got a prescription and I, and they've just started with me, but I haven't taken anything. I want you to show you how, show me how to take it and how much I should take. I want you to manage it, you know, even though I got the prescription from my doctor. I've had people do that. And I'm like, okay, well, let's start with the lowest dose possible that gives you the benefits and then assess what the downstream effects are, right? And as far as anti-estrogens go, we want to avoid those at all po at all possibility, right? Yeah. Every now and then you might have to use one because your estrogen gets a little bit out of control because you're in the finding out phase, right? But once you've done that and once your lifestyle is set up well, you're probably, the goal is to adjust your dosage so that you never need it, right? And now you're getting the benefit of your own endogenous estrogen which should be basically as high as you can tolerate for your individual needs right like hey sex drive is good uh i'm not i'm not getting uh like a whole bunch of water retention or i'm not getting you know sensitivity in my nipples or any of that and that's the perfect dose for you irrelevant of what that number is right don't go off of numbers this is hormones are definitely one of those where it's like we have to start paying attention to how do you feel how do you feel? How do you feel? Because that is actually probably the thing that I pay more attention to when managing uh, hormones, growth hormone, testosterone, things of that nature, as long as we're not doing something ridiculous, right? If somebody's taking a thousand milligrams of testosterone a week, you know, I'm, now I'm going to start looking at numbers because I want to know what the, you know, how far, how whack is this, right? But if they're taking an acceptable, normal, upper level TRT dose, then it's like, okay, well, how do you feel, right? That's the biggest thing. What's, what are the side effects if you can tell me? And if you, if you can't tell me any, I don't really care what those numbers are because I know they're doing the correct things for your particular lifestyle. But if you tell me, hey, I'm taking only 
150 milligrams of testosterone that I have nipple sensitivity. I, I uh, sometimes get emotional. Uh, my sex drive was really good for a little while and now it's really shit, you know, and I look at their numbers and they're not really that great. And then I go, oh, okay, well, we have a redox problem. We have an electrical signaling problem. What's your sun exposure? What's your cardiovascular activity? What's all this other stuff that influences the backhanded effects? Mm. So, yeah, because more is not better. That's no. what people need to understand. So also that misconception, maybe you can touch up on uh, uh, how do I even get the right word would be saturation of receptors, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and how sensitive they are, right? Because, okay, so what, so one of the things that, you know, I've noticed if there is some research bearing a little bit of this out because of the light cycles that I just talked about, okay, what, what's going to happen from tomorrow on the days are going to get longer, right? So that means that your body's going to start interpreting if you are doing all the right things. It's going to start interpreting, hey, the days are getting a lot longer. We have a reservoir of testosterone that's come up, you know, I'm talking this is what's happened naturally if you are somebody who lives a natural life, right? And what ends up happening is as light cycles get longer and there's no UV light present uh, in, in the middle of the day, because there isn't if you live in somewhere with four seasons, there won't be any until like March or April. You get an exponential growth phase from about the middle, of, from starting tomorrow, January, uh, December 21st, all the way until the end of March you're gonna have exponential growth phase where your receptors and testosterone and all the that, uh, your receptors of testosterone, the androgen receptor and other growth receptors that have to do with growth hormone and IGF-1, those get upregulated. Why? Because your body has understood, hey, we have literally met the peak of winter, the peak of short days. The days are now getting longer, which means if we can get this person to grow and become a bigger uh, human, right? But it does. Ha this happens for all animals, right? It's not just humans. They bigger, grow stronger. Yes, so that the next season comes around. If they're in a, you know, especially if they're a growing individual, an adolescent, this happens that way for a reason because the light cycle dictates downstream effects and downstream electrical potential for creating shit, right? Like growing means you've created something, right? That takes energy right? Most people are too hung up on the food is the energy. Well, maybe, maybe that's a third, right? If you follow some quantum mechanic physics and stuff like that, you understand that actually food is only probably contributing to 30% of the energy that your body actually is using. Um, not even remotely close to 50%. So yeah, all there are so many misconceptions about this as well. I'm, uh, and I usually bring up an example imagine someone is breaking up into your house and you were tired after training session your adrenaline will shoot through the roof you'll have so much energy now you you don't need a bowl of oats or cocoa pops to just fuel your <laughs> activity now yeah and, and that's a very good example of you have so much potential energy in you without any food mm. the food is just complementing uh how would i say energy but more importantly, it's giving information to your body because food is information, right? Hey, if you live in the tropics, you're going to be eating different food than if you live at a high latitude. It's that it, for the most part, right? Modern human beings have made it possible to eat tropical food in a high latitude. That's not necessarily a smart idea because you're giving your body bad information. Right? You're giving your body information internally that says, hey, I should be getting a lot of sunlight, but somehow I'm not. Right. Yeah. So that that's one of those reasons why um, testosterone dosages and growth hormone dosages, in my opinion, should be cycled um, it, it, unless you're replacing. If you're replacing, you go back to the same subject that I just talked about with the testosterone. You want just enough that you're interpreting things correctly and your body is functioning optimally, whatever that dose ends up being. So Welcome. when you go on the seasons as well, this is basically, uh, you know, time is changing, days are getting longer, you, you're you going to get this internal kind of predisposition to grow, mm -hmm. develop more strengths, all those kind of things. And this is why so many people doesn't really get anywhere because they sit in office all year round. Yeah, so they might be taking a ton of growth hormone, their testosterone level, or not growth hormone, I keep saying that, 
testosterone, they might be taking a lot of it or, you know, enough that their values are really good, but they're not getting the response they should be getting. And it's like, well, there are other factors involved in the actual physical growing of the things that you're trying to grow, right? And a lot of that has some, and I would argue a lot to do with what is your other environmental factors? Testosterone is only the uh, signaling and transcribing type of factor. In other words, it's telling your body to grow. What should your body grow? Okay, that's your training, your food, and your environmental exposure. Because yeah. everybody's been there, okay? Like even if you're doing things right, uh, where you're taking the same dose of stuff, but you take it at this point in time of the year and you haven't even thought about this and you get X result. You take the same shit at a different time of year and something completely different happens and you, most people chalk it up to, oh, it must have been my training. It must have been different or it must have been the food that I was eating or et cetera. And I'm not saying or, those Or things. maybe even, oh, testosterone. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, or, or, or to the point where like, you know, because I've seen this with people on TRT their dose is static year round, but they grow differently at different times of the year. And they start thinking, oh, why, why is that happening? Or maybe they don't, right? Maybe it's like, oh, I was eating, I was eating this food at this time of year, so I'm gonna eat it again. It, right? it, it's but, you who oversees them, usually sees a difference. Yeah, exactly. And then I start, I start chalking that up. Hey, good growing between here and here. Not so much from here and here, even though they were actually probably training harder, right? Mm -hmm. And, and volume wise, right? The metrics that I track. And then as you start to get elucidated to, mm, you know what? There's a lot of other things controlling growth uh, that you're not even thinking about. Um, and one of those major, major things is light. I'm not like, that's probably a concept that got missed on the last one where the concept was light is extremely important. Sunlight is extremely important to facilitate all these things and just taking vitamin D, for example, is a fraction of what the light is bringing to your body. Mm. It's not the whole thing by any means. It's not even 10%, yeah. right? Yeah. Or even waking up and just going on a treadmill in your little office, which has no windows, no nothing, not even a fresh air. Right, right. And so you're literally giving your body a completely different stimulus. See, that's the thing is everybody's like, oh, the stimulus is the training. So as long as I train good, I'm going to get a good stimulus. I'm like, yeah, that is part of the stimulus. But just like last time where we said, how do we set up a, a maximizing metformin around a training window? Walk to the gym, walk after the gym. That changes that environment. Yeah. You know, and, and, and that's exactly the, probably a, what a lot of people missed. Hey, I just got to drive to gym and I go on a treadmill. Like, yeah, you missed out the point completely. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. And testosterone is no different. There are some things in there that you need to consider. And, and, you know, if you're somebody who's more on the performance side of things like CEOs and things of that nature, where, hey, it's, it's specifically for CEOs and stuff. I never want to see really, really high testosterone values for them because at some point they're already getting the benefits and it's more of like, hey, let's change your lifestyle so you can continue to get these benefits for 10 years. So it's like you're a 20 year old for 10 more years, right? Whereas if you just start taking the testosterone, the first year is going to be absolutely fantastic probably. And then the next year it's like, ah, it's not quite the same. Do I want to take more? I'm like, no, no. Like, legitimately let's assess your lifestyle why is it not working as good you know obviously you age but aging is also or, or aging is your redox your electrical potential gets worse that's an aging process okay if we can manifest and keep better electrical potential for longer then you start getting a lot of the great results for longer periods of time at the same dosages of your testosterone or growth hormone. So um, what are the downsides of chronic testosterone use and testosterone abuse? Yeah. So one of them, we touched a little bit on them is um, your hematocrit level or red blood cell. If you are not managing your cardiovascular performance and getting outside, you run a higher risk of having too many red blood cells. So you, that's just, that's, Risk number one, right? So um, how so do you limit that? Simple. Yeah, simple, simple. Get cardiovascular work done. Mm. And 
diagnostically, hey, maybe you're doing cardiovascular work, but it's still not quite doing what you want. Well, there are metrics like cardiovascular work is not the same. Just, hey, I did my cardio is not the same as, okay, what was your heart rate at? Okay, was it outside or inside, right? There are metrics to this, right? So I, I've spent have... 90 minutes on treadmill doesn't really cut it. No, 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 no. I mean, that's a lot of time and I, you know, applaud you for doing that. But if it's not changing the thing that you want, why is it not doing that? Think yeah. deeper, right? Think yeah. deeper. Yeah. Hey, was my heart rate just, hey, it wasn't actually using up red blood cells. I was just walking, right? Which I'm not saying is good or bad. What I'm saying is in the management side of things, you want to manage it with cardiovascular work first. And sometimes for some people that may be aggressive cardiovascular work. Yeah. For, for other people, it may just need to be a walk. Like it's that simple. That's a genetic factor. You can make it more effective by being out. I will tell everybody this. You can make your cardiovascular work more effective by doing it outside, period. You're never going to convince me any different because the sunlight now starts to do different things with your red blood cells. It starts to transport different energy. Red blood cells can now transport better nutrients of all types, okay, when it has a higher magnetic flux. How does it get a magnetic flux? By interacting with sunlight, literally. Like your red blood cells will turn like leaves do in your blood. They will turn to face the sun as it flows through your through your blood. That's that's proven. They literally are paramagnetic. The whole blood plasma is paramagnetic, paramagnetic. That means that when it becomes paramagnetic or ma more magnetized, well, now it carries more shit. It carries more information. It carries more nutrients. Now it's doing its job more. It's ha it's working harder, right? So red blood cells start to get regulated better by doing cardiovascular work outside. Again, I think we have, we'll have to touch on that exact sentence a lot of times because a lot of people miss it, even though we've said it on almost every single, literally almost every single episode so far. And that's one of the, the things that manages, uh, one of the long-term things of testosterone use is managing it with that. That now I'm perfectly acceptable of, hey, it's probably going to be slightly higher. I'm okay with that. But that's why you need blood work that's history that says, hey, we're running a hematocrit of 52, 53, and it's been static for a year. Great. That means your cardiovascular work is doing what it's doing. If it's going 53, 54, 55, 56, then it's like, okay, instead of letting it get out of hand and then having to go donate blood, which is totally another thing that you could do, which I think you should anyway, is if you can donate blood, right? But manage it first, manage it with the proper circadian rhythm and the proper um, cardiovascular activity to regulate that. So another potential problem is um, like brain related issues, like uh, buildup of plaque and there's been some some studies showing like uh, brain development gets affected at abusive dosage of all steroids including testosterone it's exaggerated more with other uh, things like uh, DECA and nandrolones and stuff like that but it doesn't really that's long-term use and abuse where those start to kick in can you track it in any way, shape, or form by doing some kind of test? I would say not directly, but indirectly, yes, you, you can. An MRI will measure some of that directly. If you have that kind of money, yes, you can totally be tracked directly that way. As far as like a blood test, pro no, probably not. But here's the thing. The reason some of these things develop in the brain is because electrical activity in the brain gets messed up right? Going back to what I said, electrical potential will dictate how well you process all these things and how, what kind of disease state you might develop, right? One of these is in the brain specifically, it's, it's a big uh, electrical thing, right? Your brain is all electricity, neurons firing back and forth. If there is a holdup in your redox potential in your mitochondria um, and your brain, your heart, have the most mitochondria and your eye, then quickly you start to understand, well, this is, could be an energy conductive problem. Um, and a thing that will tell you uh, a little bit about a blood work thing that will tell you a little bit about someone's potential redox. Um, again, it's a, uh, how to say a synonym for it. It's not direct measurement is um, your vitamin D level at appropriate times of the year. So if you live in a high latitude, Okay, 
and it's in the winter, I don't expect your vitamin D to be high. That, but I also don't expect it to be zero, right? Mm -hmm. Whereas if you live in a high latitude and you live and it's summertime, I actually expect it to be through the roof naturally because you're getting weight, like just to kind of paint the picture. If you live at a high latitude in the summer, what do you have? 16, 17 hour days. Okay. At the equator, it's 12 hours all the time. So you're getting more sunlight in the summer than somebody at the equator. Okay. And if you happen to live at a high altitude as well, something above 6,000, 7,000 feet, the sunlight there is also more intense. So if you live high altitude, high latitude, and you don't have a high vitamin D level in the summer, that automatically tells me, hey, your redox potential is definitely probably compromised because you are not doing the basics correctly. Mm. It's just that simple. Or potentially living in an environment, literally, hey, I just wake up and I'm in my house all day long. Okay. <laughs> Working from home is very popular at moment, for example. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah, that's, and that will cause the potential development of brain issues because you're not actually making sure that your electrical potential, your redox is as high as it can be, right? Mm -hmm. And you run less of a risk of that happening if your testosterone is managed correctly. Abusing it will put you at risk for that. Mm -hmm. You could technically offset it by being outside more. You could, not, and I'm not saying it'll go to zero, you know, it all, this is all dose dependent, right? So, but if you are somebody who naturally, who, who wants to run their testosterone literally as high as they can tolerate all the time, well, hey, you got to start considering your seasons. If, if it's wintertime and you're not going to make it outside, does it make sense to run your testosterone as high as possible when you know that there are some potential issues that can come from that? Probably not, Right. Um, whereas, hey, in the summer, I actually, my lifestyle changes and I'm outside all the damn time. Well, shit, that probably means that you can handle a whole shit ton of testosterone and get a lot of good positive responses downstream from that to, as well, right? Um, so that's that's one of them and it has a lot. And again, to... blood test, blood test, blood test, because that doesn't mean, oh, I'm going out in the sun, it's free fall and I do whatever the hell I want. It just right, because like there's yeah, there's literally some cases where, you know, hey, this person is literally not able to make vitamin D uh, appropriately, even though they're telling me that they're getting a lot of sunlight. And then all of a sudden I'm like, do you wear sunblock? And they're like, oh yeah, I wear it all the damn time. I'm like, okay, we don't want that. We, we, we don't want that all the time or nearly as little as possible. If you're doing shit right, you actually don't run into a need for sunblock because you don't actually need that. Your skin has made to be able to handle UVB light. Yeah. If you're doing the basics of, hey, when do you actually, when is the first time you see the sun? Is it at noon when the UVB light is out? Well, that's not what we've been telling you guys. You need to start earlier in the day so that you get the right signals going on so that your skin and your eyes understand that there will be UVB light later, which means it prepares for that naturally. Yeah, that's that's another story. Yeah. There's like hours and hours and hours about yes. that we can yeah. talk about. <laughs> so, yeah. any any other uh, downstream effects from chronic use and chronic abuse? Yeah. So then you run into chronic abuse of of testosterone, and you're going to run into uh, the other one is heart, right? So heart, uh, you know, potential um, enlarged heart issues. Where does that come from? It comes from the original one that I just talked about, which is your hematocrit level, your red blood cells are running, your blood is literally running thicker, okay? So your blood pressure is now higher, which means your heart has to work harder and it's a muscle as well, it's gonna grow, okay? How do you manage that? Go to step number one, which is why we I started there, is hey, manage this, you manage the heart issue by a long shot, okay? Um, and then, Hydration. Hydration is another one. Hematocrit, right? Thick blood is not just how many red blood cells you have. There's a second part to that. How much fluid is in that plasma, right? Hydration also plays the other half of that role, right? So managing good hydration is also crucial for good um, hematocrit level, a good um, viscosity, thickness of your blood uh, so that your heart doesn't have to work nearly as hard. Then the cardiovascular work you know, depending on how you're doing it, will also influence how elastic your your heart is. 
which will manage the need or no need for actual left ventricular hypertrophy, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so that has to be taken into consideration with that. So that's long-term effect, right? If you are chronically letting your blood be thick all the time with high blood pressure all the time, and you're take because you're taking too much testosterone all the time, then that can lead to enlarged heart. That's a long-term issue, just like the brain, a long-term issue. Um, now, a, a positive kind of like from long-term use is uh, kind of dovetailing with metformin is it has the potential to increase your insulin, uh, your insulin sensitivity um, because you are stimulating the androgen receptor in muscle tissues for growth. That means they're going to have signals or um, the ability to use more glycogen for growing mechanisms and storage mechanisms um, through lots of different enzymes and stuff like that to make muscles bigger means it needs to create an anabolic environment in that muscle first some of that is bringing in more carbohydrates bringing in more um, ions more electrolytes more water into those muscles and that is a positive long-term effect from testosterone use um, another potential um one would be I, I i almost don't consider it a drawback only because it's easily fixed and that's fertility um so there is the potential but it's more of like the flip of the coin it doesn't guarantee if you're taking long-term yeah. testosterone it does not guarantee that you're going to be infertile um it, it just means you have now elevated the risk of fertility being an issue but even if you are infertile there are drugs that work incredibly well for fertility for a man, right? For a man. Yeah. And you can be infertile just from a lifestyle. That's number one. Yeah. A lot of people are like that just without anything. And when you look on real life examples, just look on professional bodybuilders. And I think Brendan Curry, uh, when he won his second Olympia or first Olympia, he had a child born just a couple of months afterwards. So it's like the dude was on hell of a lot of everything. And he still had kids. And Ronnie Coleman, eight times Mr. Olympia, is got like God knows how many kids. <laughs> Just, right, right. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, so that's that. I don't really consider that necessarily a drawback. It really just becomes okay. That is a potential thing that you will have to deal with if you haven't had kids yet and you want kids, right? But it shouldn't deter you from using it if you need it for sure, and using it if it's going to help you, um, you know, realize your goals because there is a very easy simple fix for that for a man for a woman you know that that's a whole testosterone replacement therapy will not for a woman okay testosterone use in general should be limited to only testosterone replacement therapy because testosterone replacement therapy done right in a woman means she never loses her cycle okay so she is actually fertile the whole time she's taking her testosterone um, yeah abusing it for a woman then becomes extremely problematic not just from a fertility standpoint yeah. so, from, so they should stay away from it as much as possible ideally yeah yeah i mean but if they need it or right so let, let, yeah so to, it's it, different for medical conditions but yeah. guys yeah. They, they usually go to extreme levels and like i just want to get jacked yeah. and you're like yes that doesn't do that, that that doesn't even do that <laughs> like, that's exactly, exactly oh, cool. <laughs> Yeah, so th that's the one that I want to, that's kind of what I wanted to distinguish, okay? So a man taking testosterone really suffers nothing from taking too much, right? Other than uh, the side effects, but as far as fertility goes or or like transformation of their face and stuff, there might be a little bit of that, right? Like water retention in the face and stuff like that. But for a woman, she takes too much testosterone, she starts turning into a man. Period. And we right. can probably throw out numbers of what is too much because too much is like next to nothing. Right, yeah. For a woman, yeah, absolutely. Anything above 10 milligrams, uh, you should de deeply consider why you're taking that. Anything above 10 milligrams per week of testosterone. Yeah, exactly. woman, per week, that's, that's per a week. massive distinction that for men, that can be probably multiplied God knows how many times and nothing potentially yeah. bad is going to happen. No, no, I have not found a single paper where someone has died from testosterone overdose. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but for a woman, you're going to run in so many issues that it's just not worth it. Yeah, not, not to take more than that. So in other words, if your boyfriend 
or somebody is telling you to take more, or even, even some doctors, they don't know what they're doing. They start them off at 20, 25 milligrams per week. I'm like, that's too much. It's too much, way too much. Mm -hmm. That's why important, it becomes even more important for a woman. Get some blood work in, get some blood work, check it immediately five weeks after you started taking your testosterone replacement therapy to verify your dosage. Women are the ones that need to verify their dosages frequently, especially when they first start. And even if they're in the augmentation phase, okay, so like they're, they don't need testosterone, but they've managed to get a testosterone prescription for, you know, because it was marginally low and a doctor, a, a longevity doctor gave them a prescription. And at that point I go, okay, let's start at four, four milligrams per week. And we will assess in five weeks, what is your testosterone level? Um, and then if it's appropriate, they should have more than double the amount of the natural range, but they should feel fantastic and their cycle should be 100% intact. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's at four milligrams. That happens very, very, very frequently. Somewhere between four and six is like the sweet spot that I have found per week where most women will do extremely well, get lots of TRT benefits slash sports TRT for a woman, and their cycle never ever gets haywire. They don't really have any negatives, side effects like voice and hair and all of that type of stuff. The moment you start going above that and getting closer to 10, you will start reaching for those issues. Anything above 10, yeah. Uh, game uh, like the potential increases dramatically like that's too much it's too much too much and so yeah but but that it's usually men who run into natural testosterone production drop that mm -hmm. causes issues in later life not women correct 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 yeah, like prostate like prostate enlargement that's another big talk to topic for for men uh taking testosterone but actually the inducible the, the induce -ing of uh prostate enlargement starts with low testosterone okay yeah so if you let your testosterone get too low then you start supplementing with more testosterone you increase the potential of increasing your prostate but if you catch your testosterone hey it's marginally low and it was higher when i was younger you probably haven't grown much on your prostate and if you bring it back to the higher amount uh, the upper level, then you're probably going to be totally fine. Abusing testosterone um, can lead, and again, that prostate enlargement is not the same as prostate cancer. It doesn't increase that. It just means that you have the risk of growing your prostate a little bit. It doesn't grow exponentially. So that means that once you've done it, like if you happen to be somebody who did it wrong, right? Like, hey, you waited until your testosterone was completely shit and then you came on. And your prostate grew a little bit it doesn't keep growing you don't really run another risk so that's also another potential non you know it's a risk that doctors talk about but it's not really in my opinion a risk that is going to cause any detriment long term because once it's hypertrophied to a certain extent it doesn't grow bigger yeah. um and then going back to prostate enlargement you know everybody's like well if i enlarge my prostate maybe i run a higher risk of cancer i'm like yeah but getting some sunshine on your balls and stuff is also anti-cancer like <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm i'm not joking in the back garden <laughs> <laughs> yeah i mean it's one of those things where like okay so why do you think you know your your prostate and and testicle cancer and um, infertility infertility like you mentioned earlier can happen naturally right like there is clearly environmental lifestyle things that are inducing this like like everybody like doesn't really know what to like the big one is infertility okay infertility is your testicles aren't doing the thing that they should be doing why why when they should right you're young you're you're active what is going on why are they not doing that well fertility has to do with life cycles i talked about that earlier if you're not getting appropriate life life light cycles how is your body interpreting that you should be fertile right yeah that's one of the key mechanisms yeah, and, and and we see it a lot and i have seen very young guys running in issues like that and you you talk to them and like, yeah but i go outside but driving to work is not going outside it's just not you know going mm -hmm. from your home to your office spending all day there and then driving back home for another 20 minutes 40 minutes whatever it is it's just not cutting because your body is just confused you're always in four walls 
Yeah, exactly. And and the same thing, like if you live in a city, hey, maybe you don't drive a car, but you walk to the train station when it's dark. Okay, yeah, you get to underground, the whatever. But yeah, in the subway, whatever, then you go to your work, you come up, you usually come up through an elevator into a building, and then you're in the building. Like, yeah, you were out and about, but you never actually went outside. That's a problem. That's, that's yeah. Yeah. you know, that's because I will put out a, a, a almost like a, a prediction, which is you will find that these types of issues will be more and more prevalent in people that live in cities. If If I had like eventually you will notice that you will notice that hey people with these types of issues live in cities even though they are technically active it's because they're literally in four walls too much whereas people outside like that live away from cities they almost have to go outside because there isn't all the convenience of being able to go from one place to another without physically stepping outside um, so to summarize it all Yes. In, in couple sentences. Basically, testosterone use is prevalent for, in both women and men. Women probably don't need to worry about it much, if at all. Uh, men, as they age naturally, will run into issues sooner or later. Let's say, I, I can't see. Let me, let me stop you right there. I think they should be the same. They should both worry about them. The difference is a woman should never embark on this ever without blood work first yeah the they, the the risk to reward is exponentially bigger for a woman that doesn't mean that the reward isn't as beneficial it is just as beneficial i will say that the the difference is women need to be what they are which is smarter than men okay <laughs> Be smarter than men, continue to be smarter than men, and actually do your due diligence. If you do that, you will be extremely happy with your testosterone replacement therapy. If you don't do that and start basing your administration of testosterone off of people that don't actually specialize in it or don't actually know you, because this isn't hard to figure out, okay? You just go and you can Google this, hey, natural women's testosterone values for elite athletes or the demographic that you're kind of wanting to emulate, you can find those values. And then you can be like, okay, my doctor gave me this much testosterone. And if you, just like I said before, you got blood work at the beginning, five weeks later, you get blood work again, and your testosterone is way higher than you think it should be. And your test and your doctor goes, oh no, that's fine. Make the executive decision to fire him and go find somebody who knows what they're doing and, and, and do something. So I will say, they both should worry about it in the context of aging, period. The difference is women now have to be more cautious if they want to pursue fixing it. Yeah. That, that, that's what I will say. Be more cautious, get familiar with somebody who knows and quiz them. Hey, what kind, not, not just don't, don't give me a, a milligram dosage. What is the end outcome that we're looking for? What are you trying, where are we trying to put my testosterone value? Where are we trying to see where my other hormones are at? Like we want, what is what am I looking for in the blood work so that me and you are both on the same page? And to, and men should do this too, but women should focus on it because yeah, the, the if overshooting is very problematic. Yeah, because Whereas side you, effects you know, are uh, not irreversible in some. Yes, irreversible in some. So so that's all I'm saying is be more cautious, be more proactive, and really nail down the game plan. If somebody's not nailing down the game plan and just giving you uh dosages don't don't take any of those because there isn't a game plan there isn't an end outcome that you yeah. can clearly see on a piece of paper but you you will hear usually in a gym uh, with guys oh i'm taking a shot of test and you're like what does that even mean you have no understanding what you're doing why you're doing and where it's leading uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. and i think i think we already kind of mentioned if, for men it might not be such an issue for women it will be catastrophic pretty much yeah, if, you don't if, you, if you get it right you will you can get the same outstanding benefits mm -hmm. of testosterone replacement just like a man does especially as you age so i will say that the benefits are clearly there you just have to be more cautious and you have to really do the basics right do the basics right and and be smart like you like women are mostly are most most women are much smarter than men much more cautious much more adept at asking the right questions continue to do that you're going to be very very 
please with your testosterone replacement, especially as you age. Um, go ahead, you were kind of wrapping yeah, up. Yeah, and the reason we are actually talking about testosterone is because it becomes so popular now when people are way more open-minded. You know, if you pick up Life Force by Tony Robbins, he talks about that as well. Uh, it's one of the most researched things there is. I'm, I'm, I think first use was 1912 or something like that. It's, it's just ridiculously long, you know, uh, compared to everything else out there. So you have clear benefits of it. You have clear uh, side effects of it as well. I like with anything, uh, mm. basic dosage <laughs> will determine <laughs> what, what you're getting out of it. Yeah, and at the does. same time, you need to understand that everyone is specific. You might be some, somebody who is extremely sensitive with it and you just shouldn't be coming near it. And if you are, like Broderick always says, Eastern European living in Siberia, you probably can get away with a hell of a lot because you're just much tougher than anyone else. Yeah, but yeah it's very true. That your environment and your mitochondrial genetics will determine a lot of the side effects that you do, the side effects and benefits that you do and don't get from your particular testosterone dosage it doesn't mean that testosterone doesn't work for you or does work really good for you because it can all change on your lifestyle so it's it's not as cut and dry as take this much right which is uh what i wanted to eluc elucidate to all of this hey yes there is a good range of where to start but there's di diagnostics on the other end. If you're somebody who's flying blind, you're exposing yourself to these risks. And I think it's also important to kind of highlight that we are talking about testosterone in sense of health. We are not talking it in sense of gaining muscle because that is not the best tool for that job. No, no, it's the, it's the best tool for optimizing health and optimizing um, longevity and optimizing your ability to be a top tier superhuman, right? That's the whole series is, Hey, you're a top tier superhuman. We're not necessarily, um, telling you that the amounts that we're talking about or the way that we are managing testosterone is going to grow an enormous amount of muscle on you. Yeah. Can, does testosterone play a role in this? Yes. But this is the basics. Hey, if you get this part of it, right. Later, if you want to explore building a lot of muscle, now that part is done. You've done the experiment. You've done the the um, how would you the fine tuning of your testosterone dose. That now, when you add something to that, it's purely beneficial, and you're not battling side effects. Right? You're not yeah. trying to figure out what's doing what because you've gone through the effort of diagnostics, proper growth, uh, proper testosterone administration, and then feedback. How does that dosage feel? How does it look on my blood work? And it, are all of these positives or do I have some negatives that I need to correct, right? You've gone through all of that effort. Once you've done that, now when you add something in, you clearly know what should be happening instead of trying to guess, is it my testosterone or is it this other thing that I'm taking? So is there anything you feel like needs adding or, because we probably can extend it for another couple hours, but I, I think <laughs> the, the baseline stuff we touched up on is amazing. Uh, just for people to understand, hey, it's probably not as bad as you thought it is. And it's probably not as amazing as you thought it is because a lot of people think testosterone bodybuilder, which is like, no, there are a million other things happening that they actually do that, to look like they do. And testosterone is probably the least of the things that they were concerned about. Uh, yeah, so yeah. Is there yeah, anything you feel like needs to be added to this episode at all? No, we touched on like mainly this, this wasn't a thing. This was a thing to lay out all of the things hey these are the positives these are the negatives consider them both and just it starts with blood work and finding somebody that knows what they're doing with that interpretation for you specifically and sometimes you're going to have to shop around like i'll be as far as like the doctor or the coach or the prescriber um however you're getting it right don't just stick to one person's dosage scheme or what they're telling you read up on sex hormones what they do average values read up on that so that you can also have an input on your blood work right blood work good person on the other side now you can start figuring it out right? blood work good person helping you out daily habits 
and only then thinking about do you even need this in your life right right because right. without because everything have... of of that nature first it, you are more likely to run into problems yes yeah if you just step in with blind eyes hoping for the best you're gonna you're gonna have issues it's just that simple you're gonna have issues yeah no awesome david i uh, appreciate your time as usual amazing uh, information and uh we're going to carry on with growth hormone. We're going to get to growth hormone at some point, <laughs> yeah. uh, most likely next video. And I think we're probably going to touch up on, on SARMs and things like that of that nature as well. Awesome. Awesome. Thanks for your time. And I'll speak to you next video. All right. Thank you. Bye. <laughs>